excited to welcome everybody who's here. Uh, hopefully we'll get a few more people to join in the next few minutes, but I just wanted to welcome you all to the virtual Mindwalks lecture series um, hosted by the Central Coast State Parks Association and California State Parks. We're very happy you're here. Um, let me go ahead and, uh, okay. Um, this series is offered twice a month on Fridays and we bring in uh, guest speakers who will talk about natural cultural resources on California Central Coast. Today we have Vicki Johnson here, a, a docent from the Elkland Forest. I'll introduce, ugh, excuse me, introduce her in just a moment. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, future virtual mind walk offerings, go ahead and visit the website listed on screen. You can also view past recordings there as well. And uh, before we get started today, I just want to mention that uh, the Mindwalks program is underwritten by the Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Eltsroth Fund and supported by the Central Coast State Parks Association. During today's presentation, if you have any questions, uh, you are more than welcome to type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So if you uh, see at the bottom of your screen there, there should be a little icon that says Q&A. Feel free to type any questions in there as you think of them. Uh, we'll be getting to them at the end of the presentation. And um, that is about it. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Vicki. Um, she is a docent with the Elfin Forest. In 2012, Vicki Johnson started volunteering as a weed warrior during the monthly work parties held at the El Moro Elfin Forest Natural Area. And she continues to monitor the invasive plant situation there. Other volunteer duties have been vegetation trimming along the trails and the boardwalk and setting up an Elf and Forest Roving Ambassadors program so volunteers can interact with visitors while keeping an eye out for the forest. <clears throat> Vicki has led, led trips in the Elf and Forest for the Winter Bird Festival, Quest to College students, as well as grade school field trips. So everyone, let's welcome Vicki for her presentation, a walk through the seasons with the plants and flowers of the Elf and Forest. Thank you so much, Vicki. <laughs> All right, I hope everyone can hear me and see me. And uh, I'm going to start with a quote. Uh, a small group of determined people with an inspired idea raised $1.6 million to save 40 acres of coastal wilderness from development. Following in their footsteps, Small Wilderness Area Preservation now, Friends of the El Moro Elfin Forest, Board of Directors, Weed Warriors, and many other dedicated volunteers continue to preserve the Elfin Forest for the future. At first glance, the Elfin Forest may look like a tangle of bushes with some bizarre pygmy oaks until you spend some time there and look closer. Good afternoon, I'm Vicki Johnson, and I'm inviting you to take a walk through the seasons in this magical forest. Regardless of the rains or lack of, the December highlight for me are the fuchsia, fuchsia flowered gooseberries, which are found along the lower boardwalk well into January. Anna's hummingbirds pollinate the fuchsia flowers and then little tiny gooseberries form. Just about every gooseberry patch is guarded by a male Anna's hummingbird. California peonies are indeed Valentine treats, which have appeared on the ground, out of the ground, along sandy trails and beneath the boardwalk. Peonies last throughout the winter, then fade back into the ground. The rare, narrow, endemic Moro Manzanita finds safe haven in the Elfin Forest. Tumash people still collect, dry and grind, the little apples as a meal, as a food sweetener, or as a drink. And on top of this Moro Manzanita, 
You can see a little spotted toey. Spotted toeys are often heard scratching about in the leaf litter beneath the bushes, searching for seeds, insects, and berries. The sea I know this bush, otherwise known as the California lilac, is covered in fragrant blossoms during the spring. Aboriginal Californians ate the Cyanotha seeds and brewed tea from its leaves to treat fevers, coughs, and colds. The slide on the left shows a bee at a Cyanothus blossom with pollen-filled baskets. This spring, Pat Brown found a Cyanothus silk moth caterpillar along the upper boardwalk. She alerted me about its location, which allowed me to photograph it. And if you can see my cursor, I will outline this little guy because he was right along, he was on a Cyanothus branch, right alongside the boardwalk and so beautifully camouflaged, you'd walk right by him. Later, the caterpillar crawled off to spin its cocoon. In about a year, with any luck, a large, lovely moth should emerge. These are large moths with a wingspan of four to five inches. I've never actually seen the moth in the elfin forest. I hope I can someday, that would be great. Yellow poppies that are found in our forest are an example of a climb or a gradual changing of an organism throughout its range. Here, yellow poppies gradually change to orange farther away from the coast. Butterflies visiting flowers in our elfin forest are best to see on warm, calm spring days. More spring yellow is found with our narrow endemic suffratescent wallflowers. Now I've had to practice saying suffratescent the only name for this lovely member of the mustard family. Off the boardwalk, overlook platforms allow for panoramic vistas of Morro Bay. April continues the yellow theme with the blossoms of the sticky monkey flower bushes. Sticky monkey flowers are the host plant of the variable checker spot butterfly. In other words, the plant where her eggs are laid and where the caterpillars feed. Bush lupin give the upper overlook platform its name, Bush lupin point. This particular photograph was taken this spring right there from the Bush lupin point overlooking the bay and the rock. If you're lucky, as I was this past May, you might spot the tiny iridescent moral blue butterfly on a bush lupin. And I have to say that the only reason I got a photograph of these little guys, they're so tiny and they, move, they just flit around so quickly, is that they were more, in this case, you only see one, but they were more interested. There were two in each other. So they allowed me to take a little photograph of them. Sitting on top of a bush lupin in this photo, sometimes seen but more often heard calling, this male California quail looks out for its cubby. Aromatic blossoms of the black sage are found throughout the spring. June heralds the blossoming of the ubiquitous chamise bushes that become covered with clusters of tiny white roses. So on top of this chamise, the elusive wren tit is usually only heard when a pair of these sparrow sized birds join in a duet of metallic calls ending in a trill. Now, Jim Van Beveren was pretty lucky to have one of these little guys pop up because they normally you only hear them and you don't see them. 
Wren tits are endemic to California and limited by and large to chaparral habitats. Also in June, woolly blue stars can be found in open sandy areas. These tiny flowers are a member of the phlox family. I found some of them on the south side of the upper boardwalk one time when I was taking my sister for a walk through the elfin forest. Halfway along our long dry season, dune book buckwheat bushes burst with cream and pink pom-pom blossoms. The light pink whorls of flowers turn darker with age. Oaks and manzanitas create an arbor of shade over the lower boardwalk. In August, the coffee berries are turning colors. These berries start out light yellow and orange, then mature to dark brown black. On the lower right is a California towhee, a common bird often seen hopping along the walk. And if you're visiting a, a, the Elfin Forest in the afternoon and there aren't any dog walkers, these little birds are so tame, they probably hop right along in front of you as you go for a walk. In September, daisy-like sand asters can be seen, as well as the delicate blossoms of the Douglas nightshade. It's almost the end of that long dry season when in October, mock heather bushes transform the dune scrub and the chaparral landscape into a sea of mustard yellow bouquets. Both the common and the botanical names describe the heather-like look of this member of the sunflower family. The mock heather bush on the right enveloped a sign that originally protected it from intrusion. And on one of those signs, a bewick wren is perched. Bewick wrens may be small in size, but they have a big attitude. And wrapping up our year long journey in November, the coast live oak is the key tenant of the elfin forest. These trees can grow over 40 feet in height inland. I took this photograph up Cayucas Creek about a month ago. Yet these same coast live oaks are often found in their shrubby pygmy form in the forest. A visitor once asked a friend of mine, why do some of the oak branches grow low on the ground? She replied, well, if you'd been holding up your arms, for three or 400 years, you'd be tired too. Common in the elfin forest all around are the scrub jays and other jays have been known to bury more than 4,500 acorns in a season. On average, for every four acorns a jay buries, only one might be recovered. Now I've read this, I didn't do the study. <laughs> if you consider, the jays may fly up to a mile away before burying their throat full of acorns. You could say that jays give the oaks legs. Located off the lower boardwalk, Rose's Grove invites one to sit beneath the leafy shelter of these iconic oaks. In the spring of 2012, Diminutive bush tits hung their foot long woven sock shaped nests beneath the oak canopy of Rose's Grove. So well camouflaged among the lace lichen, these nests had to be pointed out to me by a friend before I noticed and photographed them. So if you can see my cursor up here attached to the branch, at least a foot long and um, among the, the lace lichen, at least a foot long sock 
woven nest with a little opening right here. On this image on the right, you can see the opening a little better. And mind you, these little bush tits are about the size of a chickadee. They're tiny little guys. Uh, it takes a pair of them weeks to weave this kind of a nest with out of lice, uh, lichen, um, vegetation, all woven, all woven together with um, spider webs, probably. Again, off the boardwalk, overlook platforms afford panoramic views of the estuary, of the bay, and of the rock. What a delightful way to end a day. It took a village to put this presentation together and I'm very grateful to everyone to ha who helped and allowed me to use their photographs and taught me how to even put a presentation like this together. For more information, please visit elfin-forest.org. Any questions? This is your time. Thank you so much, Vicki, for that awesome oh, You're welcome. <laughs> Those pictures were such great visuals of the forest. It's oh, I'm... so great to see all the wonderful colors through the whole year that you're not necessarily able to see during just one month. So glad we got to see that. Um, there are a couple questions that have come through, so I'll read those for you. But I also just wanted to ask um, for folks who may not be familiar with the area or the Elfin Forest in general, if you were to give a quick overview of the Elfin Forest, why is it called the Elfin Forest? How can you get there? Um, how would you describe that? Okay, the map in the beginning, um, I added so that people could see that. I per Perhaps I could get back to that one to show you how to get to it, actually get to the Elfin Forest. Uh, apparently, um, the Elfin Forest is now on the uh, trails map, and if you want <laughs> to know what trail to take in California, the Elfin Forest pops up. Elfin Forest is basically 90 acres of preserved chaparral oak habitat, basically a tiny uh, a snapshot of what our whole coast looked like before development. And um, 50 acres down towards the estuary or state park, but there was about 40 acres from that area up to where the houses begin that had been subdivided. And in 1987 to 1994, for seven years, grassroots groups said, no, we're gonna buy this property. There's not gonna be houses and we're gonna uh, add it to this natural area. So it's not really a park, it's a natural area. Um, the boardwalk is about four-fifths of a mile loop uh, around the Elfin Forest. And there are two platforms that get you out to seeing scenic views of, that, of the back bay. Uh, if you did all of the platforms and the boardwalk, you'd walk about a mile on, on, on a wooden boardwalk. Thank you. And Welcome. everyone who's, who's here and who hasn't been there, it's a really very interesting place. It's very, it feels secluded even though you're right near houses. So I would definitely recommend checking it out. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and start reading the questions um, that we received. Um, we have one question, is the silk moth native to this area? Um, that's a good question because common names are, are, are kind of misleading. It's not the silk moth that is found, found in Asia that's cultivated in Asia to actually um, for the silk production. Our Ceanothus silk moth, it, it does weave a cocoon of her silk. That's basically, it's not making a chrysalis like the monarch. She, the, those moths weave out of silk a cocoon that hardens. But this particular Ceanothus moth, um, is found uh, in the Ceanothus, sometimes Manzanita areas. And that is their host plant. That's where the moth lays her eggs and that's where the caterpillar feeds, which was, gives it a name. So that particular moth, Ceanothus moth, is native to our area, yes. Thank you, thank you for that answer. Um, another question, are spotted togies less common than California togies there and why? Well, it depends, <laughs> you know, um, 
No, they're they're both they they they're both uh, widespread in the, in the elephant forest. The difference is somehow the um, little brown toys, the little California brown toys. I guess they have two different names, or I I call them two different things. They seem to be a little tamer, so you see them more often, especially if it's quiet and you're not walking a dog. Those little guys uh, will be searching for food and hopping along the boardwalk right in front of you. Uh, not so much the spotted toys. They they act a little bit more like birds um, in the sense that they'll 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 be foraging underneath the bushes or they'll pop up and and you know look around. But I think it's more their behavior and it's why you notice notice the brown toys more than you would the spotted toys. Yeah, that would be my take. Thank you for that. And then um, we have one question left in here. And folks, if um, you came in a little later, if you want to type a question, just go ahead and click the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can type your question there and we'll see it. Um, we have a question. Are you currently giving walks in the forest? What I understand, me or, OK, typically before COVID, the um, Small Wilderness Area Preservation Volunteer Group, now Friends of the Elmore Elfin Forest, would publicize and arrange walks every month. It was the first Saturday month or the second Saturday month, I can't remember. And they were wonderful walks, archeology, span geology, um, butterflies, plants, you name it. And we're gonna try to get back to that once we get permission uh, from state parks um, in order, I mean, from county parks to have groups. Um, at this point, there are there have been some activities with as, as much as six people. So um, stay tuned. I would say that we will advertise when we can start doing walks um, and it will be everywhere. When we advertise it, it will be in the newspapers, it will be next door, it will be everywhere. So um, that's one way. And me personally, um, the first, the first walk I'm actually going to give is for the Winter Bird Festival. Uh, and uh, that's going to be in January, but you have to sign up to the Winter Bird Festival for that one. I think you could get a hold of me through the, through, and I love giving walks. So you could get a hold of me through the website. Um, you could leave a message or there's a phone number there. And if you have less than, I'd say, six people and you'd like a little walk, just leave your name and number. <laughs> I'd love to take you for a walk. Okay. That's very nice of you. I know we're definitely looking forward to when uh, walks becoming start. Me too. They were they're wonderful walks. Yeah. Uh, my uh, Wanu, I could try to get back to that first screen. Do you think I can do that? Yeah, definitely. If you just oh, click escape. Um, escape, perfect. And then. And then I go from the beginning. Yes. yes. Oh, no. Never mind. Wait, I got it. Here we go, and then I go slideshow. Um, yes, oh. on, and then from the beginning, there. There, okay. For those who wanted to know exactly where we are, South Bay Boulevard, which connects, it goes from LOVR, Morro Bay, all the way up, um, I'm sorry, LOVR, Los Sosos, all the way to Morro Bay. Uh, the traffic light, you're, first you're going to have a traffic light there by the school, by the middle school. The second traffic light is Santa Isabel Street. When you turn there, there are various accesses to the, the Elfin Forest. In fact, a friend of mine, when he first moved here, thought all these streets were named Elfin Forest because there are signs. Um, 16th Street at the end has parking for handicap because it's the only access trail that's actually got a boardwalk that connects the parking area to the boardwalk. The other access streets have sand trails. So you park, there's a little bit more parking on 15th and there's quite a bit of parking at the end of 11th street. But again, that's a sandy trail um, to get up to the boardwalk. I hope that answered. Yes, thank you. That's a great visual. Um, Next question, we actually have a few more that came in. Okay. Um, you're getting a lot of praise and a lot of great presentation comments. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> we have another question asking, what size is the Ceanothus silk moth caterpillar? Okay, um, 
Well, it, you can't see how big my hand is. <laughs> but typically, when she spreads her wings, she or he, four to five inches across, they are big moths. And, and the interesting thing is, when they go off to spin their cocoon, that, that cocoon stays for about a year before the moth emerges. The moth emerges, female or male, they call each other out by sending these weird phenoromes, which are magical scents. They mate and that's it. Female goes and lays her egg and that's the end of the moths, but they are quite large. I mean, I don't have a real big hand, but I think this is about four inches, four to five inches across with the with their wings extended yes thank you um and someone's looking for more clarification on why the limbs of oaks are on the ground if you have um, oh, oh, more in-depth explanation yeah, the question. okay that's the million dollar question okay uh the jury's out there's lots of of ideas of why we the coast live oak is even growing in that form because the same species in Paso Robles, the same species that I took a picture of up Cayucas Creek grows straight up. Um, the groves that see that have the branches that just grow along the ground seem to be some of the oldest groves. And it's probably a combination of habitat, soil, sandy soil, uh, wind pruning, um and the fact that that where they're growing is at the top of an ancient sand dune basically is a, is what we have in the elfin forest so you don't have a lot of uh, moisture available interestingly enough when you're grow when you're walking in the top of the boardwalk and if you get yourself down to the northern part of it you're getting closer to freshwater springs some of those oaks are growing a little larger a little taller so um, it, there isn't one reason really, it, but it seems to be the older um, trees, the older groves seem to have more of their tired old branches. <laughs> that was just a joke. Yeah, so it, the jury's out. There's lots of reasons why uh, they have, it hasn't really been studied in full. So if you would like to, please <laughs> be our guest and study those oaks, it'd be wonderful. Thank you. I just think they're so beautiful when they're all spread out like that. Um, okay, let's see. Great. Uh, who is responsible for kindly providing the dog waste bags? And they also mentioned that they appreciate the artwork that they see in the display case. Oh, I'm so glad you like the artwork. I will tell that well, those are volunteers. Two volunteers got together uh, and decided that they every month they would change the, the look of the display case. Um, uh, with talking about the plants, the birds, and the insects that are available, and it's working out really, really well. So more bling and less talk, right? Anyway, so that worked out. And um, what was the second question was, um, oh, about the dog mitts. Um, we used to provide them, we being the um, volunteer group that, that are, we're basically the stewards of the Elfin Forest. We don't own the property, um, but now, uh, San Luis County Parks has taken over um, uh, making sure that the bags are there and uh, also making sure that the bag stands stay upright. Sometimes they fall over. So yeah, it's county parks at this point. 